And yes, I am using the blinding white Fusion 360 white theme this time. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yes. Uh, so I am wearing a green t-shirt right now. I was using it to uh, make my, my head, or sorry, my body less, block out less of the stream earlier. Um, and yeah, now I'm just a uh, floating head with hands, floating hands. Uh, sadly, it's not long sleeve, although that would have been a lot more fun. <laughs> um, I've actually found even blue shirts do that. So even if I take a blue item, um, even the squirtle that I 3D printed is for some reason invisible. Um, everything blue and green vanishes into the ether in this environment for some reason. Like, got the, the green board. It's red. Got the... Uh, what else around here is blue? Yeah, we got a blue circuit board just completely vanishes. <laughs> green hat and green sunglasses. Oh, no. So Luckily, I don't have any of those, but yes, I would probably just start vanishing all over the place. Um, I could probably hide behind something green, though. If I, I don't think I have any green objects around. No, they're mostly red, such as being at NC State. <laughs> um, but, okay. So, uh, actually, I'll go ahead and transition back here for a second. For those of you who remember the Keep Talking Project, we've been working on making modules. So, as an example, one of these Simon modules, which, yes, two of the keys are invisible. They are blue and green. <laughs> um, so we have our Keep Talking module. But I went ahead and actually built a piece of the frame. Um, so here it is. Piece of the frame. Um, I'm going to have to move back a little bit, actually, to make this whole, make this whole thing fit in the frame well. Um, so this is a piece of the actual frame. This is how large the unit will be when the project is complete, if everything goes as they currently are going. Um, <laughs> Yes, I, I am now in the prison of the floating face. Um, <laughs> so you can see these are special extrusions. These are extrusions that I ordered cut for this. So they are flat on one side, and on the back side they have the channels that you use to connect together extrusions. Um, just handy. It looks a lot nicer to have no visible channeling on the outside surfaces, so including the edges. None of the edges have those channels. Um, but this obviously has made me aware of just how large this is, um, given that this is over a half meter wide. This is 53 centimeters wide and 30, I believe, 36 centimeters. Uh, yes, 36 centimeters this way. So uh, this is not something you can just turn around in your hands this way easily, especially once it has depth. So we're thinking probably we're going to have to add some kind of handlebars to this or it's going to have to sit on a table um, on some kind of like Lazy Susan style rotating base that would allow it to move around on the table easily. Um, it's also not light. Um, this weighs a good bit and there's nothing in it yet. <laughs> um, the other thing that this has revealed is so if I place in a module, you can kind of see how they look in place. Although this is not a perfect uh, emu emulation of that. Kind of have that. And you can see there's that gap there. That will not exist in the final version. Um, in fact, I have a module with a shield around it. So if I use a shielded module instead, you can see a bit more of what this will look like, hopefully. Um, I'm going to insert the other way around. Give me just a moment. So I can try to position it about as accurately as I can. There we go. So it'll look a bit more like that. Have a nice dark border around it and a little bit of a 3D depth to it. Um, so I'm quite happy with how that looks. It looks very much like the one in game does. Um, <laughs> the attachment system is going to need some rework I'm finding. Um, but I'm very happy with how this is looking so far. And the size is actually quite satisfying in relation to hands. It's very easy to interact with. It's just going to be very large. Um, and the other thing this has revealed to me is that I need to make it a lot thinner than I was expecting. So 
my original idea was, oh, it's going to be fine if each of these units is a cube. And so it would be double the depth. But, I mean, if you look at it in relation to how big this is, even a single module depth is significant. Um, and so I think we're going we're gonna to mess with this in CAD, hopefully. But my thought already is that this needs to be thinner than uh, about 25 centimeters. So this is 15 centimeters. It needs to be thinner than 25 is what I'm thinking already. Which does mean that some of these modules, like this one, are going to have to be like, this is as thick as this module can be, almost. And so I'm going to have to like thread the circuit boards into the same area as it um, to make it really work. Which is a little worrying, but I think it should be okay. <laughs> um, so, with that out of the way, I'm going to place that over here next to me. And we can try to move back into CAD. So, one of the nice things about ordering your parts, <laughs> instead of design it, uh, having to manufacture them to yourself, is that you can often get uh, pre-made CAD for them. So I'm going to hop over into Misumi which is where I ordered these from. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Misumi is a... Uh, I guess we'll call them an industrial supply uh, company. You can see their site here. So they are an industrial supplier. Um, they aren't really meant for individuals to be ordering from them, but they don't stop you. Um, and so they sell all kinds of things. The thing that we are using in this case is under their materials, they sell extrusions um, of different kinds, so square metal blocks, U-blocks, all that kind of thing. Um, but what we used in this case was the aluminum extrusion. So give me just a moment, I'm gonna bring up the pieces we used. Just a moment while I bring these up. Oh, right, they're ordering. The system is a bit annoying. Um, just to make sure that stays out of the frame and will be fine. <laughs> so the way their system is set up is it does not allow me to open multiple tabs with every item in it, so I'm going to have to do so piece by piece which is fine. Okay, so this is the order I made. Uh, you can see the four different kinds of extrusion that make up that frame. And when I click on them, you'll see what comes up. So we have a 2020 aluminum extrusion, five series, base 20, yeah, that's all the normal stuff, um, with one closed side. So as an example, on the model, that would be, uh, in this case, this is this piece right here this middle bar. So 400 and you can see over here, it's 2020 extrusion. One side is closed and this is 490 millimeters long, 49 centimeters. Uh, I'm not seeing anything happening on the fusion screen. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I was uh, shuffling around some files in the background to try to make sure I had this up correctly. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, but what's cool about this is because I've ordered, you could order this and have all this, you can actually hit 3D view and it will generate, takes a moment, but it actually can generate a 3D model of the extrusion you order including the whole everything being up to spec. And I can download that CAD. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As something, as a 3D file, so something like a step, 
Um, that's fine. And generate that file. And just a moment. It will be downloaded. And there's our step file. Uh, so we can use this 3D model now in our in our CAD software in Fusion 360. So I'm going to have to do this for each of these individual models, so give me a moment. Uh, but I will do so very quickly. Uh, and you can see they have those nice codes on them, so I don't have to worry about which ones I've done. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, this should be okay. Uh, yes, okay. Um, well, it's too late now, so uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it visible. Um, normally, I'd be a little more careful with uh, things like there is a shipping number here, but that shouldn't affect anything in this case because it's already been sent. So, um, this is the T slot 2020 150. So, these are the short segments. There were four of these. Um, and I'm going to do 3D preview again. Wait for it to generate the model. So there's our little model, so you can see it's that one-sided closed. Download CAD. Step. Generate. Wait for it to generate. And there we go, download. And there's our 150. And we just do this for each of the four kinds of extrusion that were used in this project. Uh, not what I want to click. Just a second. Uh, me see me, why is your site so terrible? Um, for those of you that want, who aren't familiar with how these sites work, uh, since this is an industrial site, um, they have a million annoying things that you have to do to order from them. <laughs> Um, it's not designed for just a normal cart checkout like uh, most of us are used to, um, sadly. And so you have order numbers and invoices and all kinds of other fun things that complicate your life when you're trying to do normal things with it. Um, <laughs> there we go. So this is one of the ones where this is the corner piece. <laughs> it, once you get used to the systems, it's not all that bad. Um, it's just a little bit more of a pain. I mean, you can see how, because they have millions of things, and you can customize all kinds of things here. Um, so as an example, on this one, uh, you can see I've tapped both ends, and I've um, changed the length to 320. And so if I give you a 3D preview here, it'll be a little more complex. Um but it's super handy if you don't have the equipment necessary to do a lot of this yourself. So you can see on this model, they've actually tapped in the end, so there's a screw thread into the piece, which is exactly how the real one is. And we're going to download this one. Step, fine. go that one and finally we've got our last one here uh, do you find this is easier to use one type of computer versus others uh, as far as ordering stuff or as far as the streaming stuff we were talking about earlier Um, like, are, are you referring to doing this kind of CAD work, or second, the CAD work, or oh, the streaming stuff? Um, personally, I feel I find streaming software a lot of that stuff is easier on Windows. Um, simply because, uh. Windows gives you a lot of power to mess with stuff in the operating system. Um, create virtual cameras, override the way device drivers work, uh, reprogram devices. Um, CAD as well, to some degree, uh, you have more power 
when you're in Windows. Um, and so in general, I'd say I find Windows to be the one that gives me an easier experience when I'm working. Now, I will say that probably also is partly true due to the fact I have been a long-term Windows user. Um, it has been... Uh, it's been at least three years since I've really used a Mac proper. <laughs> um, I rarely use them. Uh, and partly... Yeah, so I, I, ha I do have some bias there. Because it has been years since I have used a lot of this on a Mac. Mind you, some of this software doesn't work at all on a Mac. Some of them, there are alternatives for a Mac. So, as an example, I believe the Open Broadcasting Suite works fine on both operating systems. Uh, however, I do not think the Virtual Cam uh, plugin works on both operating systems. Um... <laughs> uh, yeah, I... We, we lost a good a good person there. Um, but in general, when it comes to just sheer power of... Um, I guess well, I'll, maybe I'll call it community power. I would say that Windows probably has a stronger community power for... Um, uh, for m messing around with stuff. <laughs> Um, if you really know what you're doing, obviously you have lots of power in Mac. It is a Unix-like system. I'm not sure if it's actually Unix. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but the consoles, things like that in Mac are more powerful. Um, at least to a degree more powerful than things like the Windows command prompt. Um, but then again, Windows has a new subsystem, so who knows? It's kind of an even mix now. Um... The main reason I don't use Apple products is because they're hardware. Um, not so much that their hardware is bad, but that their hardware is non-repairable. And for me, as someone who regularly modifies and repairs my hardware, uh, I just can't go with that. <laughs> um, it, it, that's where I, I, I kind of draw the line with... Uh, companies that are actively causing it to be harder to fix your own devices. And Apple has been one of the biggest anti-right-to-repair uh, like lobby group kind of things uh, recently. And so I just can't... I, I don't feel personally I can support that. Um, obviously, that's not... That's just my personal opinion. Um, but as an example, like in the iPhone 12... Having it so that even a legitimate component from a new phone, if replaced into another phone, causes the phone to fail. Like, they've made it so that every device has, like, individual software and hardware keys that prevent you from fixing your own device. I personally can't accept that. Like, different screws, fine. You can be secure with that, that way you want. As soon as it comes to designing your product to prevent people from fixing it, that's where I draw the line. So I would never buy an iPhone at this point. Um, and I probably wouldn't buy a MacBook or any of those. Um, this is not something I can support at this point. But again, that's my personal opinion. They're not bad devices. They work fine. And I know a lot of people really like their ecosystems. Um, if you're in that ecosystem, it's very useful to have those features. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> it's just a case of, um, as I'm personally a technology, like, trained as a technology teacher, um, I want my devices to last as long as possible and to have personal control over them. Uh, and that's just not something I can achieve with Apple products, so I don't use them. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit hypocritical on that because I also use things like a space mouse, which arguably also isn't repairable. <laughs> um but there are some things you kind of just have to deal with. Uh, I try, I, I pick my battles. <laughs> um, and for things like, so, uh, <laughs> Space Mouse. Uh, yeah, so this is a Space Mouse. Um, this weird little thing here. Um, and so what that allows me to do is that is how when I'm in CAD software and I take a, um, I take something like this, that's how I'm able to, uh, oh goodness, what did I do there? <laughs> that's how I'm able to seamlessly move around like this 
uh, in three dimensions is using a space mouse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in general, I would say that it, like even outside of Apple products, even in their ecosystem, open source has a place. Um, some really good examples of that are things like the OB OBS, the Open Broadcasting Suite. Um, it's a little bit funky with HomeKit, I believe, but uh, things like the open source um, home control systems for smart home stuff, like uh, Home Assistant, which I use, uh, super handy, <laughs> no matter what you're doing uh, with Raspberry Pi. Um, <laughs> mice in space outfit. That would be adorable. <laughs> um but, so I guess we can actually go ahead and import these files now. So you're not going to be able to see what I'm doing. It's, it is off screen to some degree here. Um, but I'm creating a new folder for um, the, some of the new files. And I'm going to go ahead and start importing them. Um, so for those who don't know, you just do upload. Uh, select file and you grab those uh, which I think I throw on the desktop yep there we go just grab these step files um, actually I think I can grab all of them which is handy or maybe not maybe I have to do them one at a time uh, I have to do them one at a time uh, so I'm just grab these four there we go so I got these four step files and upload and it'll shuffle through those um, Fusion 360 is somewhat cloud-based, so it has to do some processing on the cloud. It takes a little while. But there we go. They're coming in as complete. And what we can actually do is we can do a look test um, between the new and the old. So this is the older system I was designing. You can see I had a 3D printed piece that would cover the aluminum extrusions that were just normal aluminum extrusions. Um, so it would have looked a lot like this. So this is a small initial test I made and you can see it would have looked quite a bit different from between this and the new uh, system we're using. I really like how clean the new one looks in comparison. Um, well, that might just be me. <laughs> I also think it does look a little more true to the game as the game model itself is very clean. Um, I think I actually have the game model. Uh, if I, I believe I placed it into, so if I go to my keep talking project, I go to resources, I go to 3D models, case parts, I believe background is the correct one. No, if it's not. Uh, frame. That sounds pretty convincing. Let's see what frame is. Sorry, you're not able to see. <laughs> so there we go. This is the original frame from the game. Um, obviously the one in game is silver. Uh, can I change that here? Kind of. Ah, that's worse. Okay. Um, but you can see, so the original one doesn't have any detailing. Uh, it's also very not straight <laughs> as a lot of game models are, um, which I find always a bit amusing. Um, but you can see that original in game model here. So I kind of like the idea of having those nice clean bars, um, even if I'm, they're not quite as fancy. And so let's go ahead and create a new CAD package and save to, yep, import CAD, we'll call this case, oh, that's caps lock. Um, that's another thing, by the way. You can disable caps lock, which I normally do. I haven't done it recently, but uh, I find it quite handy because I never use caps lock. I know some people do. Um, I feel it's a fairly useless key. <laughs> um, so I like repurposing it when I can. Also happens to make, if, if you want to do that, it would make a good mute key. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can see caps lock being useful, but it I, I don't type ca all caps enough for shift to not be how I do it. Like, I think I, I think I hit caps lock accidentally 
probably like 50 to 100 times more often than I intentionally hit caps lock. <laughs> um, but yeah, bias again. Um, and also, uh, my keyboard does not have an indented caps lock, which I find is a feature that is extremely handy. If you have a caps lock that kind of goes across, that has a dip so you don't accidentally hit it as often. Um, mine does not. Uh, I wish it did, but I'm more than happy with this keyboard as is and would not get another one. <laughs> so, we have our sketch up here. I'm going to grab... Oh goodness, which is which? So let's open one of these and see what it looks like. So there's what, yep, pretty much what we'd expect. It's just the CAD. What I can do is I can go ahead and color these to look like aluminum. Uh, given that these are aluminum, not... Uh, so these are... They're not polished, they're satin. Yeah, so aluminum satin. They're actually quite a bit brighter than uh, steel is. And so this is the texture we'll be using for all of these. So I'm going to go ahead and save that into all of these documents. <laughs> yeah, no. Things like caps lock are entirely my own opinion. Uh, and it's just because of the way I use the internet, which I know is completely not how most people use the internet. I mean, most people use social media. I barely do. <laughs> um, I, I'm one of the people who saves all the files offline to work on them because I don't trust the internet. <laughs> um, although I, I, it's been gaining my trust recently. I've started using streaming services, and they are quite nice. Plus caps lock makes it look like you're st you're screaming. Um, yeah, it, it it does come off like that, doesn't it? I mean, it is useful if you're doing like uh, as an example, if you're doing drafting documentation, you often have to use that. Um, but yeah, it does often come off when you're in like chats and things like that as being like loud. <laughs> um, yeah, italics are cool. Um, you can kind of type in italics, too. Like, there are some... Because of the way Unicode works, there are a lot of letters you can actually type weird versions of. Um, kind of obfuscated, I think, might be the, a term that could be used for it. Um, characters. Uh, so, now that we have those four documents in... Um... I do find, I really wish more of the internet supported inline formatting, inline markdown. Um, so things like if you do, uh, so a lot of things like GitHub and Discord and those ones will use like, if you do star text star, it italicizes it. Or um, uh, like GitHub markdown is probably my favorite version of it. But uh, Or if I do... Um, the quote character, so the little, uh, or not quote, um, goodness, what is the actual name of this character? Uh, the thing in the top left of your keyboard, uh, next to the squiggly tilde, um, the little single dash, um, that one allows you to add code to your, uh, text. So I can actually bring up an example of that. Um, where's my... Because I have a GitHub that I use. <laughs> um, so as an example in... What's a good example of this? Uh, maybe Simon Says. So this is Markdown. And so you can see I can put titles, italics, tables, um, bits of code. So things where they're like formatted differently. Um, I don't know if I have any major code in here. Yeah, it's code. So it's basically mono uh, monospaced fonts. All of that within a text file that physically looks like this. So this is the raw text of what I've done. So you can see the pound symbol is the indentation. The little stars make this italicized. The little dots there, a little, uh, I don't actually know what the symbol is called off the top of my head, uh, make this look like code. If you do vertical lines and horizontal lines, it makes tables. So you can take this, what is a normal text file. Um, I think that's bolding, if you do the two. Um, you can take a normal text file, 
and then convert it into a very nice looking document. Um, and I think this is super handy, personally. I really like this way of doing things. Um, but I know it, it's, it's, people have mixed feelings about markdowns like this. Um, like I also use it in, I think, random resources I have that set up. Yep. So if I go to like, I don't know, language, allows me to actually put in other characters, like bullet points, all that kind of thing can all be done within a text file. Um, but sadly, the vast majority of the internet does not support this form of markdown. Um, it just things like GitHub, Discord as a, as a platform has it. Um, I think some other chat systems are finally starting to add it, but it's not very common yet. Um, and so it's super handy because you don't have to have that little formatting toolbar like you do in Word or whatever, and you can still have fairly advanced formatting. Um, but uh, I'm going to start working to cut here. So this is the corner. I'm going to place this uh, 90 degrees here, like that. Um, wait. I actually want to rotate this as well. So it's right here. Okay, so this is the bottom. Uh, can I ground it? I cannot. Oh, I might be able to actually. Um, let's see. This rigid group. There we go. Uh, wait, come on. Yes, no? Why will it not let me make this rigid? Oh, right. I don't want a rigid group. I want to ground this. Um, <laughs> ground. There we go. So now this is immobile. I cannot move this part. Let's see. Quizlet, when you bold things with asterisks. Yep, so that's another of those. That's still marked down again. Uh, asterisks is generally... So generally, uh, I believe the, the kind of conventional markdown, which I don't know who started it. I know Discord uses it. I know uh, GitHub uses it. And a lot of these like gaming and coding platforms share this language together with each other. But I don't know who started it. It's generally single asterisks for italics, double asterisks for bold. Uh, the little, I think it's underlines on either side for strike through. Um, and then oh, I feel like there's one or two other format things that they throw in there. Oh, um, the little, the really tall, what, what is this symbol called? Um, Google help me out symbol on next to tilde. What's it called? Back quote. That's the name of it. Okay, back quote. Good to know. Um, so yeah, back quote is often used for code, which causes things to be uh, kind of in these blocky square kind of things. Um, by the way, fun facts. Why don't, why don't we go through some of these because I love them. Uh, I collect these almost. Uh, by the way, if you ever wondered where the uh, octothorps came from and why it's called the pound symbol, this is how we used to write pound. It was LB with a line through it. And throughout cursive history, it kind of got merged into the octothorpe. <laughs> um, and so, or hash, I think is what we often call it. Um, also, the pound symbol, the British currency pound, uh, came from this same uh, unit, which is li uh, libri Libra Pondo is the name of that original unit. Um, but they just took the L from it and kind of ran with that instead of the uh, whole shape becoming it. <laughs> Um, also, this gets underused, and you can't even type it, which annoys me. This is a, there is a symbol called an intero bang, which allows you to mix together the question mark and the exclamation point into a single symbol, and it is my favorite punctuation mark. <laughs> so you, instead of doing, if you, instead of doing like exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point, question mark over and over, you can just like type two or three of these, and it's like double them so you can just do that <laughs> um i love this symbol it makes complete sense to me that it exists but uh sadly it's quite hard to type <laughs> um let's see anything else fun oh that's a fun one too right uh if you ever see ye at the beginning of something so like ye old what, what we say ye it, it's actually just pronounced the <laughs> um or the i guess you could say 
um, the why, uh, the reason it was used is because there was actually, we used to not use the letter TH to represent the THE sound. We used this symbol, which kind of looks like a tall P. It's called a thorn. And so this thorn symbol, uh, they needed something to replace it uh, because it didn't exist in the Germanic printing presses. And so they actually just started using the Y to replace the thorn when they were printing on a printing press that didn't have a thorn symbol specifically. And so over time, um, the, the Y became the kind of standard fall-in for the thorn symbol. Um, eventually we started writing it out as TH, like we do now. Um, but, so, th when you, when you see Y-E, it's actually meant to be Thorn-E. Uh, this symbol, the kind of P-looking symbol. Uh, when it's capitalized, it looks a lot more like a Y. Um, and so, y it's pronounced the. <laughs> um, which I find hilarious that somehow, like... A mis kind of a, uh, a like a holdover or a, a shorthand we used in the past we forgot what it actually meant and so now we use it in the entirely wrong way <laughs> um oh goodness uh, okay yeah boba kiki that's always a fun one oh yeah and then this just is annoying to me uh red and lead or read and lead rhyme two different ways and they don't rhyme two different ways because english <laughs> Um, I think there are a few other cases of this, but this is just hilarious to me that we have two words that both rhyme and don't rhyme two different ways. <laughs> um, anyway, I have all kinds of stupid things in this. Um, we got some vocab, uh, some of my favorite words, obviously, bodge, for those of you who don't know, one of my favorite words overall. It's like patching together temporarily, um... There's not a great alternative word in English, which is I feel I find is sad. We often say hack, tinker, things like that, but um, like hack together something. But bodge is so much better. Um, <laughs> this uh, is a, one of a, the words that came out of a mistake. Um, yeah, yeah, educational stream. Why not? I love doing this stuff. So for those of you who haven't heard of a clebotic mistake. Um, this is what happens when your code kind of goes rogue and has some unintended side effects. Um, I'm not going to exactly say how it happened, but I think you might be able to figure it out. Uh, this came from a, a let's say, an over-enthusiastic censoring system um, that went around replacing, uh, we'll, we'll say, replacing naughty words with uh, slightly less naughty variants of them. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see what how, how that might be unintended, and you end up with the word clebotic. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the oh no second. Um, the moment right after you make a terrible mistake, uh, when you realize that you've done something horribly wrong and you can no longer repair it. <laughs> um, and you say, oh no. <laughs> but... Yeah, these are just some fun words I really enjoy. Um, I'm sure I'll add more as, as it goes on. Diegetic is also useful. Diegetic audio being... Uh, if you've ever noticed that when you're on YouTube, um, especially, you'll find that almost every uh, music video is interrupted or has like lots of sounds from the environment of the music video. Uh, that's referred to as diegetic audio, uh, meaning origi originating from something in scene. Um... And they're almost always added to music videos just so you can't rip the file off the video and use it as the normal music. Um, so almost no music videos in modern days actually have the original audio. They almost always have a modified version of it to prevent you from just ripping the audio off YouTube, um, which is quite fun. Um, let's see, are these worth going over? Maybe they are. Uh, why not? We'll just go through all of them. It's fun. We're having some fun today. Um... We need it. <laughs> so, this is a fun one. Dead latches. Um, you may have found on a... Uh, well, if you're in a modern home, probably most of your doors will have this. That There's like a, uh, a tab that kind of is a rounded tab. And then there'll be like a second little thing that sticks up next to it. And so it looks... Um, I think I can kind of draw this a little bit. Um... 
Okay, speed CAD time. Let's make it. Let's draw what this looks like. Um, let's do an arc. Something like that. And then. That, 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 finish. Let's do this here. Works. See how fast I can actually cut this. This, uh, normally a little shorter. And then sketch there. Mark. Here, here, there, 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 there. Ba, ba, ba. Da, da. Uh, somewhere here. Oops, wrong key. Coincident and uh, I need a, where's my intersect? Intersection, this. Intersection, this. So I'm just really quick kind of speed cutting this. Oh goodness, that wasn't supposed to separate like that. Um, that. Intersection, that. Uh, time to use a lot of collinears. This. This. This, this, horizontal, this, this, oh, whoops, right, and, whoopsie, this, coincident, and this, oops, and I think we're good. This will be good enough. Okay. That since uh, no, symmetric. And finally, ah, uh, that's about right. So uh, you probably have noticed that. Well, okay, it's not perfect. Um, but this should be close enough to what a lot of doors look like. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can go pretty fast when I'm not talking through what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you may have noticed that your door probably has something that looks a lot like this, uh, sticking out of it, depending if you have a, a fairly modern door. Um, so this is the actual latch. This is what, uh, kind of opens and closes the door, right? When you close the door, it hits this rounded or slanted surface and actually allows this to be pushed backward. Uh, by the door coming in, and then it'll kind of snap back up, right? So the thing is, you might have noticed there's a little pin off the side. And most likely, sadly, um, when you close the door, you can close it, and up to a point it'll kind of snap in, but if you give it a, like a, a good shove, you'll hear a second click. That second click is this pin moving on its own. So if I, uh, let me make sure that these are separate actually. So I'm just going to do that. Uh, new body. Okay. So, um, like, so basically like you'll, you'll close the door and it'll be like this, right? So this piece will snap up into the door frame, but this piece will be still be down here. But when you really shove on the door, give it an extra shove, this will snap up into position, right? And you might, most people go, oh, that means the door's all the way closed. Like when you give it a really good shove and you hear that second little click and it like makes the door harder to move, that means the door is closed. Um, what that actually means, so this is known as the dead latch. Uh, if this ever snaps up when the door is closed, it means that a security system has been bypassed. So what's really cool about this system is as long as this pin is down as it should be, uh, you cannot shove this part downward. So you can't do that uh, if the door, if this pin is down here. If this pin comes up, it means you can move both of them down. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to push the door shut, 
without having to turn the knob. Because it's, really, it's really annoying to have to turn the knob just to shut the door. Um, but if you think about that, being able to shut the door without turning the knob also means that if your door is locked, someone could just shove something into the spot here, like shove something into here and push this down with like a piece of cardstock or something and it would unlock your door. It would completely bypass the lock. And so the point of this little pin is to stop that from happening. As long as this pin is down when your door is closed, you, no one can shim your door open. Um, so, if you are able to close the door, like if you can close that door and you can give it a shove and you'll hear a second little click out of it, it means that your door, your strike plate, the part of the door that that goes into, is too large because that means that this is snapping up, which means that the lock on that, if you have a lock on that part of the door, it means nothing. <laughs> um, which admittedly is very common. So if you do have this, uh, it's fine. Just have a deadbolt. Something that, like, is it a deadbolt will may, may mean this doesn't matter. But if you have a door where you're relying on the little twisty lock that prevents you from turning the handle on the other side, this is really important. <laughs> um, and you should watch for that. If you can give it that extra shove and you hear a second click, uh, that means that your door is being bypassed and that you have a security system that's doing nothing. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, be aware of that one. Watch out for it. Teasing <laughs> um, <laughs> people to be locksmiths. I personally really like uh, a lot of this security stuff. I find it really interesting. Same with digital, things like uh, hashes, salts, peppers. I won't go into them right now because there's a lot of stuff there, but some other fun things, uh, so I don't think a lot of people realize this, but fire alarms and carbon monoxide alarms make significantly different sounds. Um, if you hear a fire alarm, it's generally going to be three long beeps. So you'll hear a beep, 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 beep. Like it, it has a three beep and then a gap system. Um, this is especially true if you're in like public buildings with those big annoying ones. Yeah. Um, a CO2, or, um, sorry, carbon monoxide alarm. So CO, CO alarm. Um, uh, most people don't only have one or two, which is kind of a problem. Uh, if you have a stove, a gas stove, you have to have one, I believe, by code. But I don't know if anyone else does. It's still a good idea to have them. Um, especially also anywhere near a car. So if you have a garage, you probably should have one of those. Um at least near the door, maybe not in the garage. Uh, and anytime you have any place where there might be open flame, you should probably have one. But uh, these make a much more of like a beep, 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 beep. Like it's a, it's a much, it's a, like a chirping uh, quick alarm. Generally four blips um, instead of three beeps. <laughs> uh, and it can be really nice to know that because if you have an alarm that is a, a mixed use alarm, so a lot of fire alarm, like... You can get a, CO, uh, a carbon monoxide fire alarm combo alarm. If they don't talk, you can use that beep pattern to find out which one it is. <laughs> um, now, mind you, there's no difference really from what you should do. Both of them mean get out of the house as fast as you can. <laughs> um, but if there is no fire, but it's making the four beeps, you should be very worried because carbon monoxide is arguably, I would almost say more dangerous than fire. Because fire, you'll obviously see the fire, <laughs> at least at some point. Um, carbon monoxide, you'll get tired. It basically suffocates you slowly. But you can't tell you're being suffocated unless you're aware of what's going on. You might have a headache. Um, and so especially if there's an issue where there's not a bitterant in gas and that's where the carbon monoxide is coming from, yeah, it will easily kill someone, and they won't even realize what's going on. Um, uh, something on that front as well, carbon dioxide has been shown... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, really. Uh, carbon dioxide is also, uh, interestingly enough, something that does cause effects on people. It's not something that will kill you, um, but... More and more research is showing that carbon dioxide is a, um, 
causes a lower performance in humans, I guess we'll say, um, to the point where you are slower. To, you're, like your thinking is slower in an environment with low oxygen slash high carbon dioxide. Um, I, you, you'll perform worse on IQ tests <laughs> um, and things along those lines, like testing, things like that, uh, which is a real problem for those of us in education because most of, a lot of education buildings have tons of people in them constantly exhaling carbon dioxide uh, and they don't have a ventilation system that can keep up with that to get rid of that carbon dioxide. So there's a strong argument that, in, that students in schools actually perform worse because they're in an environment where there is a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, and so, yeah, things like uh, I've actually considered personally building systems if, for my classroom that would uh, intentionally basically like crack the window uh, if carbon dioxide levels got too high in the classroom. Um, but at the moment, this is kind of still in that exploratory. Uh, we don't know exactly what it means. Uh, but... Uh, if we assume whether or not climate change is a real thing, and I'm not going to get into that because it's not really the topic here. All, uh, I do believe that there is some serious problems going on. But either way, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are rising, which means that in general, we are getting less uh, smart. <laughs> um, we perform worse in high carbon dioxide environments. And so arguably... Uh, we're running into a problem where we might be underperforming as a species because of carbon dioxide, <laughs> um, which I find a little bit ironic that all our technology is now actively potentially making us less intelligent, not like physically uh, or not like genetically or anything, but only because of the environments we've created. So cities inherently are worse for us. Um, <laughs> um because of all the carbon dioxide from all the vehicles. <laughs> um, and something that they do bring up is that if you are, and I, I'll express this as a, an actual thing you should be aware of, if you ride motorcycles, uh, motorcycle helmets, if they are not designed to have good ventilation, can lead to three, four, five times the normal amount of carbon dioxide buildup. Um, which means that uh, there can be a significantly reduced mental processing ability and like significantly longer reaction times for people in motorcycle helmets, especially on highways, uh, just because they aren't well ventilated. <laughs> um, which luckily awareness is going up on that and it should become better. But uh, okay, yeah, let's go through the last few here. Why not? We've spent most of the stream doing it. We're clearly not going to get a ton of cat done. So let's have a little bit of fun still. Um, some perception ones, because I always find these are really cool. Um, a lot of people say mirrors flip left, right? Um, there's some kind of interesting ways to disprove this, but it's more accurate to say a mirror flips in out. Because if you think about it, a lot of people say it flips left, right, but it doesn't flip top, bottom, and that doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but because it's flipping in out, and I think my, f oh, sorry. I think my favorite demonstration of this, and let me try to do it here, is that we can actually see... Uh, so a lot of people think that the reason that mirrors flip in out, that things are mirrored, is because when you write text on a piece of paper, it's backward, right? So if I uh, like write... Um, let's go... So if I, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to set up a few things here. So I can kind of demonstrate this because I think it's a really cool demonstration of the reason that we think they flip uh, right, left, but they don't. Um, so if I write the letter, the word love on a piece of paper, um, which maybe isn't the best one, but you'll get the idea of why I'm doing it. And hold it up. Oh, goodness, it's tiny. Uh, and by the way, my camera is mirrored, which is why this works well. Let me use a Sharpie instead of a normal pen. Um, so I'm going to flip my camera so it's the correct way around. Um, the horizontal. Punch form. There we go. <laughs> um, well, we'll just use the letter R. Why not? It's much more clear with a single letter. So the reason we often think of a mirror as flipping 
So if you I've letter R, right? Now we often think of a reflection. Uh, let me just use my. So do I have anything metallic here? Uh, I guess maybe my phone screen is reflective enough for it. Uh, it's not really. Um, okay, we'll just we'll just make this virtual. So we have like the letter R, right? Um, <laughs> and if I flip this, so if I go, if I mirror this, right? Transform, flip horizontal. So we think of this as, uh, so actually, actually, no, I can demonstrate this a little better without flipping. Um, so this is, this is that, right? Now, if I'm going to show this to a mirror, I'm going to, so like I, when I look at it, as I'm looking at, right, it's the letter R. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we've got the flowing letter R. So we got the letter R here, right? I'm looking at the letter R. Now, the thing is, when I show it to a mirror, I'm turning it toward the mirror, right? I really wish I, do I, do I not have a mirror sitting around here somewhere or something that can work as a mirror? Um... I feel like I must, I should have some kind of like piece of glass somewhere around here. Uh, well, is the phone screen visible enough? No, you can't see the reflection at all. Um, okay, fine. Well, anyway, when I'm looking at, right, I turn it toward the mirror. And so the thing is, is I, like, I'm turning this over to face the mirror. Um... And so it's not that it's backwards. Because, I mean, if you look at it from this side, like the side that's facing me, it's backwards to me too. Because <laughs> um, I've turned it to face the mirror. It's not that it's flipping it. Because if you think about this side facing this way, it's the same thing as the, like the, through the card. You can actually see it the same way. And so this way, or the R, if I had a reflection of it, would be the correct way, um, which is why I want a mirror. Um, there must be a way I can do this. Oh, wait. I think I might have an idea. Um, let's try this here really quick. So if I use a camera as a mirror instead, uh, flip it around. Let's see. Yes, this works. Okay. So you can see... Uh, so this is this is a mirror, right? Uh, let me brighten up the screen a bit. It's just a camera, but it's acting as a mirror. If I raise my right hand, uh, and I'm not sure how... It's not really that visible because it's tiny in your screen. Give me a sec. I'm going to zoom in on... This is the most... In, definitely the most involved demo I've ever done of this. <laughs> there we go. We've got zoomed in, right? So if I hold up the R... In my hand, you can actually see in the reflection from the back side of the card, right? It's seeing the back. It's, uh, it's the right way around, too. When I'm holding up something in front of a mirror, it's only because I take this and I turn it to look at the mirror that it's backwards. It's actually just flipping it in and out. <laughs> um, and so it, the only reason we get this idea that like I raise my right hand, it raises its left hand. It's because we're mislabeling the hand. Because we're flipping things to look at them in the mirror. <laughs> um, which I, like, completely blew my mind. I'm sure I'm not doing as good of a job explaining it as I feel like I should be. Um, it completely blew my mind when I, when I realized that, was that it, it's very much a case of... Uh, the way we assign the value to a mirror, the way we have called it, we turn text to face the mirror. Um, and so that's where our misconception came from. Um, let's see, some other fun ones. Ah, yes, so the color pink and the color purple don't exist in the rainbow. They never have. Um, <laughs> our electromagnetic spectrum goes from red to blue. And it actually is a case that because of the sky being blue, we see the color in the rainbow as kind of like purpley. Um, and then my favorite one by far, the color brown doesn't exist. <laughs> um, the, the color brown not existing or the rainbow you're, you're in denial of. 
Um, because I can actually demonstrate the reason why the color brown doesn't exist, and it's really cool. Um, oh, the rainbow. So, the thing is, if you look at, like, a picture of an actual rainbow, um, so let me see if I can find a picture of one, which is probably not going to go well, because all of them are fake. Yeah, a picture of an actual rainbow, it's just dark blue. This is blue. <laughs> Um, it's because there's a lighter blue next to it that we see it as being like a purple color. Um, if I color pick um, the color here, that's not, no, color picker, come on, color pick. No, wait, I want to grab the color out of the screen. Where's the, uh, pick color from page, there we go. Right here, ish. That, that's definitely blue. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's because of our perception, we see this as being like a purpley color because of how it's uh, in perspective. Now, mind you, if you have a rainbow like this, yes, this is purple. When the red from here overlaps with the blue from here, there is purple. So if you have a multiple rainbow, you can say there's purple in the rainbow. But, uh, yeah, things that where you have an actual purple color like that, it, it's not purple. Uh, like this is the color of the rainbow. And this down here is the indigo color. <laughs> um, but what's also cool, and I think this is, even, personally, I think that the color perp, uh, brown is the more interesting one, is that the color brown really doesn't exist, like in a much more literal sense than the other ones. And I can demonstrate using Photoshop, which I, uh, is interesting. Um, if Photoshop was uh, working, what, what happened to Photoshop? Windows, what have you done? <laughs> Adobe, Photoshop, goodness. Uh, just a second while I, well, I'm, well, sorry, I, I transitioned. I wanna make sure there wasn't like a, uh, document I was working on for a client or something on there. Um, <laughs> never know. Well, I just want to be safe. Um, there wasn't. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to create a new document, though. So, if I create a document here, we have a white background, right? Um, and I'm going to make sure it's pretty large here. Uh, I'm going to do that, click that, there we go. I'm going to make a little block right in the middle. No, I, I know what I'm doing. Stop. <laughs> um, just a little little cube in the middle, right? I'm going to fill this with brown. Um, or something close to brown. I, this isn't the best brown to do this with. Uh, let me make a new brown. Um, oh goodness, what? why do they keep changing things? There we go. So brown is, I'm going to go into the orange range. I'm going to go about here. Brown, right? That's brown. Uh, does this, could, do people agree this is brown or is this too bright for brown? I want to, I want to make sure people agree that this is brown before I go on. This is brown? Okay. It's brown. Okay, uh, now this is the fun part. I'm going to change the background color. I'm going to change it from white to black. It's orange now. <laughs> um, so brown is orange with context. <laughs> um, the only thing that humans use to determine what is brown and what is orange is the surrounding color how bright it is in relationship to the surroundings. If it's darker, it's brown. If it's lighter, it's orange. <laughs> um, and from what, I, from what I know, this is the only color we really do this with. Uh, we kind of do with pink, but pink is more about the saturation of the color. So with red, um, if it's a saturated color, we, oh goodness. <laughs> if it's a saturated color, uh, come on. Like, we call it red. If it becomes unsaturated, somewhere around here, we call it pink. Um, we can still kind of do this to a degree. Like, if I go to about 
this might be far enough. Um, and uh, it kind of works with this, not so well. Um, but for the most part, like I like I personally, I would call that pink. And then when we flip it, I would say maybe that's more of a red. <laughs> um, I'm not, but that one's definitely more up in the air. But it's really interesting that because we have a linguistic name for those colors, even though they're just different brightnesses of the same color, so especially with orange and brown, they're just the same. They're the same color uh, in the hue space. You can see. So if I go up here, that's orange. If I go down here, it's brown. Uh, the only thing that determines it is the brightness. And so we've determined that these colors are what we call them. But when it comes to the actual reality of the light, there's no difference. It's something that the human brain creates. Um, heard about cyan, magenta, and blue being the real... So, that's an, so this is an interesting argument. Um, and I actually can show something in Photoshop that makes this... Interesting too. Um, I'm so annoyed that Photoshop is broken in the. I need to fix that. Um, this one. So I would personally argue that the true primary colors, as far as I'm concerned, are red, blue, and green. Because they are the colors of light that mix to make all colors. Um, so if you have a red, a blue, and a green light, uh, they make all colors, right? Um, however, you could also argue that the primary colors, the real primary colors, are uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow, because cyan, magenta, and yellow in the form of dyes, so in the form of something that uh, absorbs light, are the three colors that you use to print everything. Um... And I might be able to demonstrate this. Let me see if I can. Uh, I'm going to have to do some weird stuff in Photoshop if I'm going to be able to. Um, so I'm going to do that. We're going to do low opacity. About 50%. And I'm going to have to change the way colors work, I think, to make this happen. Um, but if I do red, I need this to be bigger. Uh, that might be big enough, and then low hard, no hardness. Okay, red. Uh, green. And blue. That okay, doesn't work too well on this. <laughs> um, oh, this is an opportunity for me to actually bring this up, though. So, Something that a lot of people uh, don't realize about the way colors work on monitors is that we don't store colors as perfect values. Um, and I'm gonna, I need to turn it to FSC, there we go. So if I have a red boundary like this, right? And I make a green line that is blurry, or uh, actually we'll just use a green line in general. Um, we're gonna make it not blurry. That looks okay, but you'll notice that if we start blurring it, so if I go filters, uh, blur, I'm going to do a Gaussian blur. See how there's all of a sudden like a brown, a dark brown line in between them? And that doesn't make any sense. Like why would there be a dark brown line between them? And it turns out this is because we store color the way that human eyes kind of, uh, kind of see. Because human eyes are much more sensitive. So the, uh, I can share with we see logarithmically. Um, if you think about like the beginning of our sight, uh, if I double the brightness of a light, so let's say I go from, I don't know, 100 lumen to 200 lumen, uh, it gets double as bright, right? But if I go from 200 lumen to 300 lumen, it's not double as bright. It's gotten 100 lumens brighter, so it's like an extra half as bright instead of being double as bright. Or I guess it's double. Yeah, you, you get the idea. And so because of that, we store color information in a scale that is uh, not matching how we see. And so when we mix red and green, 
we end up with this like muddy brown between them, which looks terrible. Um, but if I use a blur uh, and I have to go into the color settings for this, if I change my color settings to use, oh goodness, where's the button for it? There we go. Mix RGB colors using gamma instead of using, uh, yeah, I believe this is the switch for it. It will now switch into a mode where colors are treated as humans see them because gamma is logarithmic. And we should be able to do a blur now. Oh no, this, that didn't fix it. Where's the button? <laughs> I, I, it's been so long since I've actually messed with this. I couldn't remember where the correct blur tool is. Um, give me just a moment. Blur. Is it lens blur? Is that what I need? Mm. There we go. A lens blur. You'll see it actually becomes yellow in the middle. Um, and this is how humans see. We see things like this, right? This looks right when we blur it. Um, but it's process. It has to do things a little differently. Um, and so what's interesting is that the vast majority of the internet uses blur wrong because of this. Um, which is kind of painful because it means like one of the big examples, if, if you have an iPad and you have a background that has lots of red and green next to each other, you'll find the blur gets like muddy brown. <laughs> um, so it's just good to be aware of that when you're editing. If you can switch to a color space that doesn't involve, that doesn't have this issue. Um, and I believe I can do that in here by going to, oh goodness, if I can remember what the color space is called. And I feel like they change it every so often. Um, where is it? Uh, edit, no, file. So right now we're working in RGB. There is a better color space for color accuracy. Where did it go? Color settings, there we go. No, I don't. Um, I want the, uh, that's fine. I, I don't want to work on that. I want to work on, oh goodness, where is it? <laughs> I need to switch the document into a different color space. Uh, here we go. So if I switch this into something called lab color instead of RGB color, you can see now, so one thing you can see that that previous line I drew has that dark edge in it. And I'm actually going to demonstrate this even more clearly by using um, uh, a brush that is not a perfect uh, like sharp edge. So if I make this not hard and use green. You see we get this nice, like that's a very nice color transition there. Um, we kind of got off topic. We were originally going to do fusion, but we ended up talking about random stuff for a while and got into uh, color spaces somehow. Um, so we were just talking about the fact that uh, by default, Photoshop uh, uses a color, the color space RGB. And let me actually make this so this is fully visible. Oh goodness, Wait, come on, there we go. So by default, there we go. Um, if you go into the image adjustments, uh, or sorry, mode color, it'll be on RGB color. And you can see that red and green look terrible next to each other. <laughs> you end up with this brown muck color in between. Um, but what's interesting is if I go into image mode and switch it to lab color, which is color that is automatically logarithmically, it actually looks correct. <laughs> yeah, we started off with uh, showing some of the stream uh, stuff, OBS, how this works, um, and then kind of, we're going to move to Fusion, but got off topic pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if I can actually show this in a way that... Uh, I think I can. So let me grab a um, be 
I'm going to grab an image uh, of something very colorful from an open source, from a free place to get pictures. Uh, probably something like Pexels. Um, grab a nice picture of nature or something. Um, let's see, something colorful. <laughs> And I know it's off screen. Oh, it'll be on screen in just a second. I'm just trying to find something. Uh, it has a fair amount of different colors near each other. Oh, this should work. So I've got an image here. Uh, I'll go ahead and bring it in. There we go. And I'm going to just crop out everything else. So right now we are in the lab color mode. There we go. So I kind of want to show why this makes uh, such a big difference here is if I start editing this image when it's in lab versus uh, not in lab, you'll see there's some significant differences that occur. Um, so I'm going to try to zoom this in enough for it to be easily visible. It is quite pixelated. So one thing, what, first thing we'll do is we'll blur it the two different ways. So I'm going to duplicate this layer. I guess we've gotten off topic into Photoshop now. Um, <laughs> stream of color, oh no. <laughs> so if I blur this, uh, using standard Gaussian blur, uh, we'll go about to five pixels worth of blur. Right? So this looks quite nice. Um, I'm going to actually bake in that blur, so I'm going to do a rasterize layer. So now this is a confirmed blur, we can't undo it. Um, I'm going to duplicate this again. I goodness, I think I really need to lay this out a little better. Uh, duplicate layer. There we go. Okay. Hide that one, bring in this one. I'm going to switch the color mode from lab to RGB. Uh, don't merge. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, sorry. Took off my glasses. Yeah, very much. In the case of lab color, it is very much that. But you'll see if we if we blur this using Gaussian blur that it's a little different, and I'm, I'm curious how visible this will be. So this is blurring using RGB. So you can see there's some strong blues now, and there's kind of like a dark contrast edges between them, right, like right there. If I, but instead we blurred using lab color, like we did before, you can see instead of becoming dark around the edges where there's this contrast and becoming kind of muddy, it actually becomes lighter around the edges. And so this is this is how the it would realistically look if we were blurring this using a camera lens. I mean, not quite because it's Gaussian blur, not lens blur, but that's another issue. Um, but if we RGB blur it without using a color space that's designed for acting like a camera, we get these like darker, more saturated, muddier colors. Um, so the, I found when I found this out. It's really interesting because you don't notice it a lot, but especially when it comes to blurring things that have lots of color in them, you'll definitely notice that it, you'll get better results using lab color. <laughs> um, it is really subtle on this picture though. It's just like around the edges of things. Um, it's much more obvious with strong colors, especially opposite colors like reds and uh, greens really clash when they're blurred. Um, I think I can also kind of show what how lab color affects um, something like, let's see if I can do this, uh, duplicate, I'm gonna duplicate again, and again. Okay. Um, I think I can maybe show how this also affects adjustments, although it's, this is even less obvious in a lot of my experience. 
Um, so let's say I wanted to use levels and I don't know, brighten up the colors a bit, something like, uh, okay, but maybe not use levels, let's use uh, contrast because that's what a lot of people are messing with is we'll just use the kind of standard brightness contrast and we'll crank up the contrast a bit, uh, maybe like 20. And we'll crank up the brightness a bit, 40. So we're at 40, 20. Um, and I'm gonna bake that into this image. So this is the one we're doing in the RGB space. Um, and I think this should be a visible difference, although it'll be subtle. Um, so we did 40 and 20. I'm gonna turn that off, click the next one, do switch my image into lab mode. Don't merge. And now I'm going to do the same adjustment here. So brightness contrast, 40. 20. Well, not 200. <laughs> 20. I believe those are the same numbers we used before, right? So, that, that, and then I'm going to merge these into one. Uh, where's my merge button? Merge layers. So, this is the RGB way of doing it. This is the lab color way of doing it. So again, it's one of those subtle things of, and it's almost stylistic in this case, but you can see that this is way too saturated for being bright. Um, it, it looks like it's fake in, a, in an interesting way. Whereas lab color, because it's emulating what an actual camera lens would do, kind of gets this softer, lighter color as I brighten it. Um, and it's even more obvious if I like if I'm taking the original and I'm messing with these sliders, uh, not, not levels, I want brightness. You can see that the brightness slider like kind of changes it. So they, you see things become white in the background as they get brighter. Um, and as contrast occurs, they kind of brighten up as well. The, they become sharp. Um, so you get these strong, and when it gets darker, you can see that the colors kind of get dim, but still maintain their saturation. Um, whereas if I, I'm gonna undo this effect, I'm gonna switch back over into RGB. Image, uh, where's it? mode, RGB. Don't merge. And I use that same slider Brightness contrast. The contrast now makes things kind of like there's some color that I'm losing. You can see it's not getting that kind of pink brightness. It's just going away. It's becoming orange and blue. Um, and if I brighten it, it kind of becomes yellow and you get these weird harsh edges like that. In lab color, we didn't get any of these artifacts from, so you can see like if I, so actually this is an interesting comparison. So I'll do this one. Um, let me duplicate layer, yeah, that. So this is maxed out everything, right? So if I take this and this and merge them, hide it, bring back this one, switch over to lab color. Uh, don't merge. Adjustments, Brightness contrast and crank both of these up, we can see just how different the two the two are from each other. Like this one creates this like, lab color really creates like this over brightening of things. You can see the kind of pinks and blues, but you can see they're still kind of almost hazy when they become mixed. Whereas RGB crushes the color into these sharp, harsh colors. <laughs> um, and crushing is probably a pretty apt word for it, given we're hitting a bitrate limit as, of RGB's ability to mix colors. Um, and so some people would argue that this is less appealing, like this kind of became uh, almost a little gray compared to the like absurdly vibrant RGB. But 
I would also argue, I think this is more realistic looking than this vibrant RGB. <laughs> um, and this all has to do with the way we perceive light versus the way computers store light information. Um, which I don't think we have time to get into because we have like five minutes left. But <laughs> um, hopefully this has just been interesting for So what I would recommend is if you are using things like Photoshop or because uh, we do this often in the space with image editing um, or if you're in the designs, any of the design spaces, pay attention to what kind of color you're using. And if you're doing a lot of editing on an image, switch it to lab color mode instead of RGB. You'll get better results uh, long term. And you can always change the color bit depth information. So also in mode, you can see that we can change it to 16 bits instead of eight bits. Even though there isn't any information here that like we're not adding information by changing it to eight, 16 bits, like you see, it remains the same. What that allows me to do is when I do something like a blur, I lose less information about the image. Um, because I have, like, I'm expanding the amount of information the image can hold so that when I, uh, blur the image or darken the image or brighten the image, a lot of that information still stays there. So that if I need to change something later on, I didn't like, I, I didn't compress the image in a way that makes me lose that information. Um, which sadly is what happens if you, which is why I would, I would recommend always keep the original images when you're editing because you can even if i can technically undo something i've done the vast majority of image editing things uh are mathematically non-reversible so if i go into this image and i do a levels on it and i crush the levels uh why is that not happening uh oh that's why there we go and i like crush the levels to bright or I crush the darks, something like this, that information is gone. <laughs> uh, even if I un even if I take this image and I then made another levels after it to try to like undo what I've done, you can see it doesn't work. Uh, the information is lost forever as far as the uh, file is concerned. And so the nice thing about having more color space is you can sometimes undo a little bit more of it. Um, not perfectly, but it helps. <laughs> Horror movie flowers. Yeah, we've really messed up this uh, wonder, this beautiful landscape, haven't we? We've just created something entirely uh, nightmarish. Um, <laughs> but okay, um, I guess we'll kind of stop trying to do new stuff here, and we'll uh, call it. So, are there any more like last questions? Anything inter someone's interested in? Um, I mean, I just imagine, like, this now, like, if, if you had, like, the people are, like, this big in this, like, like, alien forest kind of thing. Yeah, that would be terrifying. <laughs> um, and that just looks like some kind of, I don't know, like, irradiated. <laughs> um, zoom out a little bit. Yeah, we've definitely uh, have destroyed this image. <laughs> <laughs> Special posters for finals week. Oh no! Uh, admittedly, that this is pretty cool looking. Like it's not really what we're. Let's see. Uh, we'll, we'll do a final. Um, see what happens if I blur this. Blur. Lens blur. Hopefully this doesn't. Oh, that actually looks quite nice. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> uh, that semester's going pretty well over here. Uh, I'm I'm working through it. Um, let's see. Oops, so not sure what we'll be doing next week. I think next week is the last set of streams we're doing before the break. Um, I think I'm doing both streams next week if I remember correctly. So, yeah, not sure what we'll work on there. Prob probably some more Keep Talking Nobody Explodes if it comes to it. Um, and we do have the whole frame here that we can mess with now. Uh, <laughs> break, yes, I am excited for break as well. It'll be nice to finally have a break after uh, the, the very 
involved schedule we've had this semester. Um, oh wait, does this actually blur via a lens shape? That's cool, I can change the shape of the lens. Ooh, triangle lens. Hexagon lens, octagon lens. <laughs> can change the shape of the bokeh. Bokeh, whatever you want to call it. Geometry. <laughs> uh, this blade curvature. Oh, that's how round it is. Cool. See so if you want to make a circle, you need more blades. Cool. <laughs> well, I think it's about time we probably called off for the night. It's eight o'clock here. Um, hope everyone enjoyed our completely off-topic stream. Um, uh, before we close the stream, I'll just go ahead and change the title in case it changes it permanently to, uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure how we actually store the name, but we'll go with, uh, making the most space. Followed by... Let's do that. Why not? Okay. Update. <laughs> yep. I know I, I had a good time tonight. It was just fun to just mess around for a bit. <laughs> um, of course, with my, my, fl my floating head due to my, uh, my green shirt, which um, I'll, I'll probably not do for any more streams, but it was kind of nice to have it out of the way a bit when we were uh, showing the other effects with OBS. <laughs> yep. Have a good night, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and close the stream. Bye-bye.